Welcome to the Bonneville Up to Speed podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Oste, and this is a podcast covering all things land speed racing on every level, from vintage small displacement motorcycles to cutting-edge streamliners and everything in between. And today, we're honored to have a very special guest, builder and driver of the Valley Fever Streamliner, Mr. Brad Bosworth. Brad, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kevin. Good to be on. Appreciate the, the offer here. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It's a, it's our pleasure. So um, we've had other guests in the past that have been involved with streamliners and uh, various other forms of land speed racing, but none of them have built a, uh, a 30 foot long streamliner in their home garage. So tell me, how'd you get started on this project? Uh, well, well, I've been, I've been racing pretty much my whole life. And, and, uh, um, in 2009, we had a friend that, that had a roadster at Bonneville, a street roadster with a, um, uh, six cylinder Jimmy in it that we went to kind of go kind of support him. And that was the first time in, that I've ever been to Bonneville or, and my first, actually first uh, association with with Bonneville period so um somebody warned me about salt fever and, and sure enough they were they were right so when mm-hmm. I came home I had this idea about uh, maybe trying to build a streamliner myself and and um, see what I could accomplish so that's how it kind of got started okay so there's a lot going on there I agree that uh, once you go out to the salt and experience it uh, it is addictive so uh that's almost a warning. If you're <laughs> if you're into <laughs> racing and you've got an addictive personality, just be warned because you're gonna you're gonna go back. So what uh, what's your um, your skill level set, your day job, whatever, to be able to take on a project like that? Well, I I started welding and fabricating when I was probably 13 years old and and became a career welder. Um, did that for for a number of years and and. Uh, in 1989, I uh, decided I wanted to be a welding inspector, so uh, I became a certified welding inspector, and I've been doing that ever since. And still welding, of course, but not welding for a living, but inspecting for a living. Mm-hmm. So the good thing there is that you can uh, you can trust your welds that this is going to be a safe vehicle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I I tend to look at other other welds on other things and and try to try to not you know, judge too bad, but, but you see some things that are pretty, pretty sketchy. Um, not so much saying in, in land speed cars or, or any kind of other racing, but in any welds anywhere, you know, I, you can, you get into a career like that and it, it's like a, a plumber probably looks at people's plumbing too, you know, so, yeah. but, uh, but, uh, you can never yeah. turn it off. Yeah. So part of what, what we do is besides just visual welding inspections or we, we write welding procedures and develop you know, specialty welding procedures and certify welders. And then we also do construction testing and inspections for like steel erection of new hospitals and, um, and schools and so on and so forth. Right on. So it's a, an industrial background that is totally based in safety and, um, so is land speed racing. So it kind of goes together. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now the ability to weld does not make you a streamliner builder on its own. There's a whole lot of other stuff going on. So how did you, uh, how did you approach this project? Did you do it by yourself? Did you look at others? Did you just go through the rule book? Well, all, all of the above. I, I, um, you know, I, I've been involved with fabricating, building race cars and, uh, and drag motorcycles. We raced drag motorcycles for a long time. I built my own chassis for that, but you just kind of, you know, learn some fabrication techniques for different types of um, vehicles and stuff just from association with the sport itself. But um, when I got to Bonneville, you know, just, just looking at the uh, construction of uh, some of the streamliners that I saw out there, I mean, it kind of kind of looked like a, uh, if you look at some of the lakesters, kind of looked like some of the top fuel dragsters only on steroids, you know, the material is much heavier and so on and so forth. So I figured it, it couldn't be too big of a, a challenge to to come up with an idea myself and, and try to put something together and and um, boy you know when when I stepped in it I stepped in it all the way because <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to be near as complex of a project so uh-huh. um, yeah I did I did research uh, uh, a lot of you know other cars that have been out there over the years successful cars and stuff and read a lot and and I got you know kind of hooked up with some people out there and who kind of tried to steer me the other direction. And, and of course I don't listen real well. So 
and then it ends up uh, I had a concept in my mind and um, and that's what that's what the car turned out to be so I'm I'm, I'm pretty uh, kind of pretty blown away actually how the thing turned out with because uh, I can literally say that going into this I, I had no knowledge of of building any any type of land speed racing vehicle at all I had no experience and I didn't really have any connections with those groups of people back then it was all drag racing and and stuff like that so well that's it's a really interesting arc because a lot of people that get interested in land speed racing will maybe go out and and purchase uh an existing car and maybe you know fit it to themselves maybe change the class you know the engine or whatnot and then run that see if they like it and then you really have to be in my opinion way deep into it to say i'm gonna build a car um, but especially for your, your first time out to build the car for your first experience and a streamliner that goes really, really fast. I mean, that's going whole hog. Yeah, we, you know, we initially built this car. Um, we put a Hayabusa motorcycle engine in it only to um, figure out maybe getting out there to get some experience and, and maybe get licensing. And we weren't really trying to focus on anybody's particular record at the time. Um, but that, that little engine, you know, proved out to, um, to perform well enough to get me my double a license. And, and so, um, the, the car was never really, I, I never really thought about it when I was building it about building it to be a motorcycle powered vehicle. So I always wanted it in mind. I was always wanting to have somebody be able to put a bigger motor in it or have it available for somebody, somebody to partner up with a larger motors. So that's why the, the car is bigger than, than most of the motorcycle type streamliners. So, um, and that, it just kind of evolved. And then now we've, you know, now we're in the F class right now with a, a three liter Toyota two JZ motor in it. And here we are. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's interesting. So let's talk a little bit about what this car is, because uh, obviously this podcast, people can't see it. Um, I mentioned it's a, a big, long streamliner. Um, Take us through, you mentioned the, um, the the first engine was the Hayabusa, but take us through the driveline and, and, and what this thing is. Okay, well, the car's, I'll just give you some kind of overall basic configurations, but the car's 30 feet long. It's weighing in now right at about 4,000 pounds. Um, the steering in the front is, is set up uh, as a tandem, one wheel in front of the other. Um, mm. Very similar to uh, George Poteet and Ron Main's Speed Demon. Um, the car is about 19 inches wide at the front. I'm sorry, 17 inches wide at the front. And over the rear wheels is about 33 inches wide now. Um, it's uh, 30 feet long. And like I say, the power plant now is a, a twin turbo, uh, 183 cubic inch Toyota 2JZ with a turbo hydro 400 transmission and a highly modified uh, Winters Extreme Liner quick change rear end. And with a link suspension in the back, so which is all new to the to this uh, this car this this last year. So, mm. so on the uh, the previous combination with the the Hayabusa engine, what kind of power were you making, and what how fast did that thing go in that class? Well, we you know again we just had stock cases on that thing, so it was a a stock bore size which was eighty cubic inch with a turbo on it um intercooled all that all that stuff and then uh they're capable of making you know upwards of 750 horsepower but we <laughs> we never really had an opportunity to to really put much of a tune or boost in the thing um during my double a license run out there i think i was at 260 well actually i was at 290 um in third gear and kind of thinking if i just shifted it it might go 300 wow <laughs> but but uh we literally maybe had 20 pounds of boost and, and, uh, you know, just a kind of a Rube Goldberg tune up in the thing. We didn't really know much about what we were doing out there, but, um, when I shifted it, there was such a gear split that, you know, the thing fell off boost and mm. I went out the back door like 264 or something like that in, in third gear. So, um, that's yeah, it, it was a potential 300 mile an hour car. If we just was able to, um, get the, the engine cases to hold together, uh, it was just too much load. The car was just, I think, overall too heavy to put the stress on those little thin motorcycle cases. 
Um, yeah, but that's an extremely impressive effort to have a big car like that at that weight um, winding out at that speed. Uh, that That's pretty mind-bending. So I'm guessing with the 2JZ motor, I mean, this thing's going to fly. Yeah, you know, we had uh, JMR with Real Street Performance drove it last year and got his blue hat. Um, he's got quite a quite a video online if anybody ever gets to see that. But, uh, um, yeah, with, you know, again, a whole new package engine package drivetrain suspension and everything was un, was untested before we went out there last year and and jay shook it down and and uh, uh ended up with a new record on i think we he had a three he was at 331 and i think his qualifying uh time was actually 322 and some change and then the next day he backed it up with a 310 and uh, so our average new new average record is just a little over three 316 miles an hour now and uh, here we're just getting started with this thing. That is fantastic. <laughs> so cool. So back to the just getting started concept. Uh, this is, you know, going back to your first time out. What year was this, 2013 or so? Uh, the Hayabusa was the first time out there, yeah, 2013. Okay, so you show up, you got a brand new car, you're new to the sport. How did you, how, how was the licensing process? How did, how did that go? You know, it... I was told that I'm one of the few that that actually had gone out there with nothing and ended up with a double A license during speed week. So I was pretty, pretty uh, excited about that. Not to, to be going out there and not really know what I'm doing, you know, and, uh, I could have done better had I had a little bit more experience, obviously in driving, but um, yeah, it actually went very well. And, and mechanically we'd, we had a few little issues, but um, everything panned out for the licensing and it just went fairly smooth. I thought, well, that's an amazing feat because the double A license is up to what two ninety nine. Yeah, I think just after that, the next thing is once you go over three hundred, they they give you a, a cursory unlimited license. But basically, you know, double A, you can go as fast as you want now. So sure, sure, um, and but that's you know five licenses in, I think. So most people start uh, they've, they've got that mandate that you got to go what less than 150 or so on your first rookie run and then you graduate license to license and not everybody has the opportunity to have a vehicle that goes fast enough to get a double a when they first start off so for you going from zero to, to hero in one week is uh, that's that's really unusual and impressive yeah I thought it was I thought it was pretty neat and all the people that are involved with it were really excited as well. And, and, uh, and what's difficult mostly about the licensing thing is you're, you're right. You need to have a vehicle that, you know, to achieve what license status that you want to go to. But, but, um, you know, going through the license stages at Boston or stages at Bonneville, um, people need to, to just pay attention and, and make sure that they do only what they're told and nothing more because it's a safety thing. And, and, uh, our SCTA officials work really hard at, uh, making sure that, that everybody does this stuff in as safe as possible. And, and so to not follow directions, will get you starting right back at the zero point again. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny for those, um, who have not experienced this, there's, there's been a little bit of a stigma around the tech inspection and the rule book and the licensing at Bonneville, where it can be very difficult, uh, to, to do what you want to do. But you said it, it's all steeped in safety. So they don't want anybody having any problems. And if it becomes, you know, a, a battle between the, the car and the, the tech inspector or, or trialless uh, and having to repeat license um, runs, that's all so that you can come back and do it again. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because, frankly, you know, if, if you want to play in their sandbox, you, you've got to you've got to follow their rules and, and the rules are there for a reason. And, and, uh, that's as simple as I, I look at it. I, I don't argue with anybody. If, if they say something needs to be fixed or changed, then I generally just go, go change it. Mm -hmm. Um, so now looking at this car, uh, some of the other um, streamliner builders and, and uh, racers that we've spoken to have been talking about some really high tech situations of, you know, a lot of the electronics, the data acquisition and the aerodynamics and people using, you know, finite uh, element analysis and, and looking at aerodynamic software to uh, computer simulate all the high and low pressure. And how did you approach the arrow on your streamliner? Cause it seems to be working. 
Well, it, I'm going to be very, very honest here. You know, I'm not an aerodynamicist. Like I said, I'm, I'm a welder fabricator and I, I get concepts of designs in my mind of things that I've built in the past. And when I, when I think of the way something should look, and usually when I finish building it, it kind of looks that way. I consulted a, a lot of people and tried to get information and, you know, everybody, everybody has different ideas when it comes to the aerodynamics on a car because you talk to uh, people that are um, aerodynamicists, you know, for, for a living and, and design aircraft, they're, they're not dealing with a, a vehicle that's, that's running on the ground. So there's other, there's other things involved other than just air going around a vehicle. So, I mean, you've got, um, you know, you've got the ground, you've got tires that are spinning that create disruption. And there's a lot of stuff there that, that could really um, make a design good or bad. But, um, my design is just basically my vision of what I thought needed to be um, accomplished in order to make something go through the air good. And that's really as basic as it was. I mean, I've, I've got no computer programming or uh, any computer assisted design or any of that in any of my building stuff. I just not never had access to any of that nor, nor knew how to use it. So <laughs> that's, that's so cool. I mean, I, I love the high tech aspect of what these guys are doing, but I, I really like the fact that somebody can do this without having NASA, you know, in on the next block. <laughs> well, exactly. You know, I mean, that's a, um, yeah, I mean, you, you could come up with a, a design of a brick out there and, and obviously that's probably not a good choice, but, but if you have some, common sense with with uh, how air should flow i mean you typically could i mean i guess it's just me saying this but it, you, you typically could tell you know what would be good and what would be bad you obviously don't want any you don't want any flat surfaces sticking up flat that's going to slow you down or or a very blunt canopy for instance it's going to be ramming into the wind you want to try to keep it as smooth as possible so that's what i've tried to do with 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 my within my own capabilities anyway mm -hmm. so well, and one aspect that was kind of interesting, um, I was uh, chatting with uh, Aaron Brown from the garage shop, and they built that uh, Dodge Daytona uh, land speed version of, of the old NASCAR and also a, uh, a Talladega. And what he was saying is that the side load wasn't enough on the shape of the car. The rear end was too narrow, and he didn't have that side loaded resistance, and it would get squirrely at speed. So it's, you know, aero is, there's a lot going on. It's, it's, as you mentioned, the frontal area and just the kind of the slipstream of making it as sleek as possible, but to control that aero uh, and make it work for you is stepping into another league. I think an advantage with a streamliner is that it's long enough to where it's got that side load uh, kind of under control to a degree because the air gets pushed out of the way at the front and then it wants to wrap around it towards the back. And if it hits the car, it, it helps keep it going straight. But are these things that you considered also? Yeah. The, the, you know what? I think that the big part of, of streamliners being stable is a vertical tail fin. And I know there are some streamliners that, that don't have vertical tail fins, but they're either running a, a canard type wing or their body design is giving them um, stability somehow, but, but like our car, for instance, is, you know, the tail fin is going to be bigger. It's soon, uh, not this year, but mm -hmm. that's, that's the next step is because it's starting to go speeds now where we're going to need that stability. Um, so things change, you know, as you go faster, of course. So, um, but yeah, some cars don't, don't have rear stabilizers. Uh, I'm talking about streamliners, mm -hmm. rear vertical fins, um, and you know that they've been successful there's there's been several that have been very successful like that so i think it has to do with maybe some of the shape of the of the body itself too so coming from your motorcycle racing background and drag racing um i know we, we've spoken before on this show uh, about the difference between a drag race and a land speed race you know drag race is all off the line and and in a, in a land speed especially at bonneville you apply that power later on and you need that traction and the whole thing. So I know those differences, but personally, how does it feel going that fast? Well, you know, I had several people um, tell me that, oh, you know, you're just going in a straight line and you're in the middle of nowhere. It's got to feel like nothing, you know, but, um, you know, I'll say up to maybe 150 miles an hour. I, I could agree with that, but 
but once it starts once it starts um, accelerating you know with the traction and the car starts to really move you see those quarter mile markers start coming at you a little far faster and I'll, I'll tell you you know um, when you you know when you're getting up in the 250 260 and, and a plus range um, you can definitely tell how fast you're going and uh, and yes it is out in the open and you can look kind of look out to the side and you, you could see the sidelines moving by somewhat slowly but but you get a, a a big sensation of speed being being on the course having those pylons pass you yeah i can imagine especially at that speed i can't believe you had the time to look to the side and actually see see the sidelines going by well i, I forced myself to do it a couple of times just because i thought i needed to <laughs> yeah, yeah just get that experience probably, anyway yeah, it's probably not the smartest thing to do but so, um, how does the car feel at speed? Does it, uh, I mean, you think at that speed, any steering input could have some pretty serious ramifications, uh, and the suspension has got to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. And, and the, you know, the, the height of the car changes, the faster it goes. So, I mean, what, what's the feel behind the wheel? Actually, you know, my car it is, seems very stable. Now, when I say stable, it, it keeps going straight. Now it doesn't, it doesn't do nothing. It, it, it does, it does drift. Okay. So it, I don't know if people listening maybe have ridden dirt bikes in the sand before, but you just have to kind of let it go in the same direction, but let it kind of do what it needs to do. But yeah, steering input, you don't, you don't want to be, you know, moving the steering wheel around very much, but you can control it. I mean, just do things very slowly and, and very, uh, cautiously, you know, um, there's not really much need to drive the car around on the course unless, you know, you're trying to avoid a bad spot on the course itself, which is sometimes we'll start on the right and, and end up moving over to the left because we were told that in certain areas of the course, it might be a little looser and you might want to avoid that. So you kind of anticipate doing that ahead, ahead of time. So you don't have to wait till the last second to try to do it. Otherwise you'd probably have a problem, but, but, but our car handles, uh, I'm going to say it handles very well, and, and uh, there's very little. If you can watch some in, in car videos of, uh, especially of the runs that Jay made last year, he's got some good examples of of uh, how the car steers. If you could watch those videos, because he's very little steering input at all. If I mean virtually none. So, um, yeah, it's it, like I say, unless you're you know needing to avoid something you, you, in that kind of situation, you have to plan ahead. There's no no last second uh, abrupt maneuvers and that kind of thing at all. Sure, sure. Well, that's really great that it um, that it's it seems pretty predictable and it does what you want it to do. Uh, that is an interesting uh, um, kind of concept to me that you have people saying there might you know something might have happened on the course at the three and a half mile mark towards the left side, so you want to steer to avoid that, and that even at that speed you can still plan your route. Uh, a little bit, which uh, I had not really considered at that speed. Yeah, it, it you know, you, you do have, to, they're very cautious about uh, notifying the drivers before you take off on your run that, that there's uh, maybe some loose areas or, or the course isn't as good at, at, you know, at the two and a half or three mile on the left as it is on the right. And so you can kind of make some decisions before you even get pushed off at the starting line. And, and a driver needs to do that. Um, just for those reasons, you know, so you don't want to, um, come up, up, come upon the problem, you know, so quickly that you're not able to react and cause an issue. So, um, so yeah, you have, you kind of got to plan it out ahead of time and just kind of, once you get going, just kind of stay with your program, you know, um, cause you certain, like I say, you certainly don't want to try to at those speeds, you can't try to go, uh, you know, putting a lot of steering in the car, you're going to have an issue and, and, and besides, if you're on, you're trying to make a record run, you, you want to keep the car as straight as you can. Um, you know, you know, moving from side to side, you know, can cause drag and maybe cause issues with your speed. So sure. Less efficient. Yeah. Yep. So backing up a little bit, uh, I read somewhere, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you, you literally built this in, in what, like a three car garage? Uh, yeah, there's quite a story about the garage, but yeah, it's just what conventional three car garage with one small garage door and one bigger one. And <laughs> when I, de- when I decided to do this, I, um, you know, it was literally, we came home from speed week in 2009 and, and, uh, that was in August. So in November I had a chassis jig already put together and it was, 
di fit diagonally in the garage and there, there wasn't any room for anything else. So that's where the initial car was kind of started. And, um, and then once, once we got to a point where it really started to become something, you know, we tried to figure out how we were going to get it out of there. So, so the joke's always been is like the guy that builds his, a big yacht in his backyard and can't figure out how to get it out. That's right. <laughs> get it out. So, um, and no, I didn't have to tear my garage down to get it out. I was lucky enough that we, we came up with a system to, to get the car in and out. But, but shortly after that, um, we have a fourth bedroom that's built onto our garage and, and, um, I think my wife had to go to the store one day or something and my, my toolbox accidentally fell through the wall and oh, whoops. Gosh darn, I had to take the wall down and darn it and clean everything up. So meanwhile, I, I just kind of used it as part of the garage. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of took over a, a fourth bedroom on my house and, um, now it's, it's kind of a joke, but I promised her that when I got done with this, I'd, I'd put the wall back up and make it bedroom again. Wow. That is a funny story. Uh, which, you know, kind of brings around another topic and that is the, uh, the support of the family. So, uh, I'm, I'm imagining your wife's, if she was, you know, willing to put up with you, uh, putting the tail fin in the bedroom, you know, she's got to be fairly on board with this. Well, she's, she's been very supportive and, you know, I raced when I was racing stuff when we got married and, and, um, uh, you know, she's been, she's been, uh, putting up with that you know, my hobbies like this for, for a long time. We've, we've been married 47 years now. So, wow, congrats. um, so she's, she's wondering if, 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 you know, if I'm about done with it, <laughs> but you know, she's, um, uh, she's very supportive of it. She's, you know, she's not a, she's not interested in racing that much, but, but, um, she, you know, she's been very supportive and, and my kids, they've all been, they've all grown up around it, you know, anyway. And my number three son is the crew chief for, for the streamliner here too. And, um, That's he's, cool. uh, yeah, he's, he's actually going to be driving, uh, eventually driving a roadster for white goose bar for Greg waters. He's going to probably get, try to get licensed up this year, hopefully dynamite. Yeah. So, Has your wife ever been out to a speed week? She, when I run the streamliner, if I'm driving, she'll be there. Um, and when I'm done driving, she'll go home. Yeah. yeah. Well, there <laughs> but you go. she's there. Yeah. She's there when, if I decide to run the car, if I'm going to be driving it, then, then yes, she, she comes out. That's she drive cool. all the way out there by herself. She just, wow. Right on. I think that, uh, that's, that's pretty important. Um, not only to show the support, but I imagine setting a record in a streamliner and then trying to call her and tell her on the phone what that was like would be a little bit more of a challenge than her being there. So that's cool. Yeah, what's really nice when she's there, she's she's right at the starting line, and uh, uh, she's one of them that gives me the thumbs up, you know, when we're ready to roll. So. Yeah, great, great. Uh, so, I got another quick question about the uh, the Valley Fever name. So, where did that come from? Well, I'm glad you asked that because it's very important. Um, when I was in high school, I got hooked up with a speed shop, local speed shop back in the day here in Fresno, California. It was, it was named Eddie's Speed Shop. And, and uh, the guys had a, uh, they'd purchased the Eddie's Speed Shop from the original owner way back. But uh, when I got hooked up with him and started hanging around and stuff, one of the owners, an engine builder guy, Mike Garrison, uh, had his own junior fuel dragster. And so I started hanging around and, and got to work on that and help out and, and then became part of the crew. And we all became pretty good friends. And then as time went on, um, Mike and, and a couple other guys got uh, hooked up with Rance McDaniel and, and they decided they wanted to go top fuel racing. So, uh, they built the first Valley fever, top fuel dragster. Um, so uh, I was involved with that and working crude on that car. And then they built a newer one later on. And I worked on that a little bit too. And then I, I, about that time is when I got into my motorcycle drag racing. So I kind of ventured away, but, but the, the Valley fever name has been a big part of my life. And, uh, so when I got into this project, I, I went and actually looked, uh, looked up Mike Garrison. Uh, he was at a company he's had downtown Fresno here called engine masters. And I hadn't seen Mike for probably 30 years. Um, but I went and, and talked to him and told him what I was doing and, and asked him permission to keep that Valley fever name going and, and let him know what that meant to me, you know? And so he was, uh, he was he was very uh, touched by that, and he he endorsed it all the way. And I also asked to talk to Rance McDaniel, and Rance said the same thing. And 
And so uh, as long as, uh, as long as I have control on that car, that it'll never be anything but the Valley fever. So, um, <laughs> That is great. It's uh, yeah. I love that heritage um, and and that they were cool with it. And it's it's really kind of an extension of uh, uh, appreciation of what those guys did too. Oh, absolutely. And, and on and that you know that I gained so much knowledge from being around those guys and being around that that time. You know that it, I can't even explain how much uh, uh, that means. You know because you you can't get experience unless you're out there around it and doing it. And so to to surround yourself with people that are successful like that, you know, it makes you feel like you, you've got some um, pretty good teachers, you know, back in the day. Sure. Things, things you should do, things you shouldn't do, and, and you know, so on and so forth. But um, so, yeah, and then all the people, um, you know, I have to say, sadly, Mike Garrison had passed away a few years ago. And, uh, uh, you know, we run his tribute on the car on the top. We've got his his picture and, and a de- dedication to him. Uh, Rance is still around. He's, he's still, um, he, we can't get him to come over and visit one very often. He's kind of wants to do his own thing, but, but Rance is still around. Um, but a lot of the guys that were involved with the team back then are still around and we have hot rod Fridays here at my house and, mm-hmm. and people come and we hang out and, and it's, it's a, it's a big kind of a family deal. You know I mean? Everybody that's associated is, is a big supporter of the car. So, um, yeah, it's been it's been really good. Yeah, that that's so cool, and I bet uh, I bet there's some great pictures of Hot Rod Fridays over there. We 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 have some fun times over here. I'll tell you, <laughs> it, uh, you never know who's going to show up. That's for sure. Yeah, right on. Uh, well, I have um, a personal story with Valley Fever that I want to share. That um, is kind of interesting because you you don't know any of this, but you've uh, been able to really help something in my mind. And, and he, here's what happened. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, the illness, Valley Fever. Oh, yes. Right? So uh, in the Southwest, uh, for those who don't know, Arizona, Southern California, Nevada, there is a, uh, a fungus that can be found in dust and in dirt. And if you ingest this, you breathe it in, it can get you sick, right? And it's, um, it's called coxioidomycosis, and uh, the street name is Valley Fever because it was kind of discovered in the San Joaquin Valley in, in Southern California. Mm-hmm. Well, my, uh, my, my parents moved to Scottsdale uh, about 25 years ago, and I've, I heard of this, but I didn't really know much about it. So two years ago, uh, I was working an event in Scottsdale doing an off-road show. And they were doing some Jeep demonstrations, rock climbing and stuff, kind of near the stage where I was working. And apparently, I inhaled a couple of the spores. And about three weeks later, I was very, very sick. And my wife, uh, I live in the Midwest, so I came back home. And my wife knew the fringe valley fever concept. Um, My dad actually uh, contracted this later in his life. And he got the version that most people get, which is, fatigue and a lung thing and you get over it in a couple of months but if you're the lucky winner like I am um, it disseminates into a different part of your body and, and mine went into my spinal fluid and I had meningitis oh, no. and I was uh, a couple of weeks from being completely smoked I mean it was it was bad I was out of the shop for almost 40 days and around here in the Midwest nobody knows what what valley fever is or coxioidomycosis because it's not part of this area and I found a good doctor at St. Louis University and as soon as I got the test done and landed on what it was I got medication and and bam I'm I'm back to back in business so ever since then and that was in 19 2020 2020 ever since then whenever I would see or hear the words valley fever <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly get a little bit of a chill. I'm like, oh. and I saw it on, on the streamliner and I was like, oh no, you know, what, what's going on here? But uh, uh, by, f- and in my case, I'm going to have this forever. If I take my medicine, I'll be fine. If, if I don't, if I get off the, the antifungal meds, I might have a problem again. So it's, it's always there, but I, you know, I'm not, it doesn't define me. But seeing your streamliner and reading, the stories and, and watching the videos and hearing about the success of it, I have now reconnected the term Valley Fever with racing and with something cool and with Bonneville. And now when people talk about Valley Fever, I'm like, oh, yeah, did you see it? And they just got a new motor in it. <laughs> people are like, what are, what are you talking about? So I, I thank you for that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm glad you're all right. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
it was a little dicey there for a few, but everything's fine now. So um, I just had mentioned the new motor. Let's talk about this 2JZ. So uh, what what uh, what tricks have been done to this thing? What kind of power are we expecting out of this guy? And um, an RPM, too. Well, I, the motor stuff is, is not – I'm not really much into the – the technical stuff on it for sure. But I, but I do know, you know, it, um, that real street performance, Jay Marr, um, as you know, puts the thing together and he's, he's works very closely with Brian Crower at run DC. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, the rotating parts, you know, cranks, rods, uh, valve trains and all that stuff is all run DC, Brian Crower stuff. And, and, uh, I think Manly does our pistons. Uh, Jay is a phenomenal, expert at, at building the two jz engines in fact they drag race these things primarily is what they their kind of business was was you know building drag race motors for these not not just those imports but other import vehicles as well but the primary the two jz two jz they they've been uh, hugely successful because it's such a strong engine you know a strong yeah. base um and some of their drag cars if i'm not mistaken and not not to be quoted or anything but i'm, I'm thinking they're making close to 2,000 horsepower sometimes with some of these things and their their cars are running in the sixes at over 200 miles an hour. So um, the drag race thing. So this yeah. one, this particular motor, he's kind of dubbed it uh, called the RS, you know, Robert Sam RS 16, which is uh, he claims like he's making like 1600 horsepower on gas, you wow. know, turbo turbo powered with with um, on gasoline. So um, I'm not sure exactly what kind of boost it takes to do that but it's up upwards over 30 probably 32 35 pounds um uh, guessing mm-hmm. so um yeah extremely um just a neat just a neat motor inline six cylinder that were originally came out in the toyota supras and the early toyota lexus mm-hmm. so um yeah they're they're very impressive engines and i'm kind of doing the math in my head and, and if this thing if you're so you went 267 on the Busa motor, and then last year that was the debut of the 2JZ, and, and it's gone. What did you say, three? Well, he was at 331 on 31. on a, during one of his qualifying. Well, on the, on the first qualifying run for the record, it, but he was continually letting off the throttle to modulate boost. We we had problems with over boosting, so he was con, con, he, he was uh-huh. a, he was like 60 two or 64 percent throttle or something and at 322 and some change i think is what the is what the qualifying pass ended up being for so we went to impound um and then the next day um you know he was he was trying to keep the speed down of course we want to try to keep the record somewhat lower so we can all have a chance right Mm -hmm. so he's uh he his qualifying backup run was uh around three 10 or 311 so the new average between the two is 316 and uh 316.2 or something like that so uh it was on a a 291 record that was set you know uh, several years ago so Mm -hmm. Um, well there's that's that's uh, a couple of good points there so first of all there's a lot left in this once you get the boost control figured out and uh who, who knows at this point um you know how fast this thing can go but you guys are not the only ones. It's it's kind of a, a common thing to be respectful of records and not just go out there to shatter them into a million pieces. Um, I know other racers who they just want to go a couple of clicks faster. They get their name in the book, but leave it open for another attempt or somebody else to come by. Exactly. And, you know, um, these kind of things need to be done in, in small steps anyway, because everything that... Um, I mean, unless you, unless you've got a car that you've already set speeds at higher rec, I mean, uh, uh, records at higher speeds in, and then you're just you know bumping different classes and doing that. That's different. But but on a car that that you know we're progressively you know trying to go faster and we haven't been that fast yet. You don't want to just um, you don't want to be you know ha- too too haphazard about you know throwing the power to it and then having something um, mechanical go wrong or or maybe the handling's not going to be the same when you're getting up into a, an area of a range of speed that you haven't been before. So, um, you know, again, we, you can be as safe as and cautious as you can, but you just, you still have to be, um, careful with your motor packages as well and not try to, you know, not, to, not try to put something in it. That's, you know, going to, this possibility to go 400 miles an hour, uh, and, and just crank it on, you know, you need to, you need to take baby steps to get into that and, and work your way up there to make sure that, 
everything's going to be going along as it's supposed to. So, Right. And that's part of the philosophy of having a record run needing a backup pass because you could turn it up to 11 and do 400 once, <laughs> you know, but you got to be able to do it again, which means you got to learn about how you got there and be conservative on the parts. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. R- RPM, you were asking about RPM on the engine. I forgot to comment on that. Was it, I think he likes to see somewhere around 80, 8,500 RPM. So. Nice. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So what, uh, what can we expect this year at Speed Week? What are you working on? Well, I'm going to be jumping in the seat again this year. And, and uh, oh, good. Uh, we're going to, yeah, we're going to, uh, we're going to see if we could just, uh, you know, bump up Jay's record a little bit now. And uh, there's other, there's other uh, uh, team members that, that I'd like to, to get in the streamliner as well. And um, I'd like to get Keith Peterson and Jared Collier a chance to get their blue hat as well. So, um, yeah, part of the White Goose Bar uh, group, you know, is, is, I mean, those guys, they get, they get people in their cars and they can get them in the 200 club. And they've done that a lot with the pickup and the roadster. So, uh, yeah, it, it's quite a team to be part of. I'm, I'm very honored to be part of that. So I want to share that, you know, uh, with all the help that they've given me, I want to be, be able to give some of our member guys a, a chance to maybe get, get their blue hat if they want to. That's outstanding. The, uh, the generosity of the, the racers and the, and the teams in this sport is, uh, is always really cool to see. And you mentioned the white goose bar guys, um, when you go out to Bonneville for Speed Week, you'll see a, an impressive setup of a couple of trailers and easy ups and a whole bunch of people having a great time under the banner of White Goose Bar. What's that story all about? Well, the, the basic story was, is uh, is Mike Mangelli years ago um, bought a new uh, enclosed trailer, a gooseneck trailer. And um, when it came to Bonneville, and, uh, they, they unloaded the cars and he folded down a little table inside and, and put a few cocktail components on the table and, and uh, that kind of dubbed it the, the white goose bar, meaning white goose neck. There it is. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Awesome. But uh, that's that's a very short version of it. There's there's more to the story, but he has quite a uh, quite an explanation usually that's that's on a uh, poster on the inside of the trailer. So if anybody ever gets to Bonneville, gets to go by and donate to the kitty and make himself a cocktail and they can read how the white goose bar came about. So. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those, uh, one of those little nuances of, uh, you know, once you go out there, you know, and you feel a connection because, uh, you got to have that little experience. It's cool. Yeah. It's, it's quite something for sure. Um, can't, so, can't tell you enough about the people for at Bonneville for sure. Yeah. 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 Well, um, so this will be your first time driving the two Jay-Z. Yes, and with with and the first time driving the car with the suspension and stuff in it as well. So, so um, in a way, you're kind of starting over. Pretty much, yeah. It yeah, it's it's a uh, it's going to be a um, yeah, it's going to be an experience for me for sure. So, um, you know, watching watching the videos and stuff that that we've got uh, data from when Jay ran, you know, the the steering on the car and handling and everything still looks the same. So, uh, and then his input. Uh, from number, nobody or somebody that hasn't driven the car before, you know, was very valuable to me because he he explained exactly uh, what I felt when I when I drove the car as well. So I know I know exactly what he's talking about, and so I that kind of confirms my thoughts on how the car was is uh, handling with the suspension now too. Mm-hmm. So in the the data library that you have from the previous engine to this one. Can you kind of compare the curves and, and know a little bit on what to expect as far as how the power rolls on and, and the response? Yeah, it's totally different now. I and, bet. Uh, and it's going to be totally different again this year because we're switching our uh, from a single turbo to twin turbos now so to manage that a little bit better. So, um, so yeah, we're in process of getting that completed now. And, and uh, yeah, so it's going to be a different ride this year for sure. Mm-hmm. Well, again, part of the uh, excitement of doing this is the ability to modify the car, change things around. In in some cases, you can change the class or, or the whole power plant or whatever, and it keeps it interesting. Uh, it's not doing the same thing every year, for sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then this is, a, uh, like I say, we're, we're just getting started with the F motor. And, and at some point in time, you know, I'm sure that 
you know, maybe they'll want to put an e-motor in it, you know, same configuration, so everything should just swap out and bolt up. It's just a cubic, an- a cubic inch uh, class change, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, the futures uh, with the two JZs, you know, I mean, there's a lot there. We're just barely getting started with this thing. So I'm, uh, I'm anxious to see where it goes. Um, yeah, I think we all are. And where can somebody uh, kind of follow you on, on social, Facebook or whatnot? Yeah, I mean, I'm on Facebook, just with Brad Bosworth, but uh, uh, I don't have any special Facebook page for the Valley Fever. But um, I had a website going for a while, but I haven't had time to mess with it very much. But uh, it, it's a, I think it's a lands, landspeedstreamliner.weebly.com. Um, we'll have so, uh, people check that out to uh, to follow along. Of course, the big thing is uh, we invite everybody to come out and see it in person and see it and hear it run. But uh, if you can't do that, I guess uh, the socials and things like this are the next best thing. Right. But uh, Brad, I, I really uh, appreciate you taking the time to uh, to share the story of this car. And, and again, reinforcing the fact that it, it can be done by somebody who has determination and doesn't necessarily have uh, a huge backing or facility to do it in. Yeah, definitely. Uh, something was, It's difficult to build stuff in your garage. You know, we've, we've had a lot of external help as well, but but primarily, yeah, uh, the car was built in the garage. So That's too cool. Well, again, I appreciate the time, man. It was great to chat with you. Looking forward to seeing it run uh, at Speed Week this year. I'll be out there. That'd be great. I, 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 thanks for the opportunity to be on the show, Kevin. I appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. And hopefully uh, maybe we can have you join again and do a recap after, uh, after Speed Week, see how it went. Yeah, absolutely. Just let me know. Very cool. Well, the Bonneville Up to Speed podcast is produced with the uh, the AOK of the Southern California Timing Association and is available on all major podcast platforms. Subscribe if you're into land speed racing and share it with your friends who are also. Uh, and also be sure to visit the scta-bni.org website for all the latest news and the calendar of SCTA racing events at uh, El Mirage and the Bonneville Salt Flats. Thanks for tuning in. And for Mr. Brad Bosworth, I'm Kevin Oste, and now you are up to speed.